Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. Today I am here to talk about a bit of a difficult subject, something a lot of people have a lot of very different opinions on. So it might be controversial, might not be. We will find out. First, I just want to say because of the time of day, the sun is hitting this little, uh, almost like a wind chime thing we have in the tree. So you might see little disco ball effects going by. There's nothing I can do about it. It's just going to be what it's going to be. And maybe a disco ball is kind of appropriate for a conversation about what defines LGBTQ literature because disco balls. But anyway, <laughs> this conversation has grown out of the LGBTQ in translation read along for February and March. The selection for that was The Membranes by Chi Tao Wei, which is published by Ari Larissa Heinrich. Now, not everybody in the group has finished the book yet. It is for February and March, so some people were working their way slowly through and we're giving people a little bit of time. But in preliminary discussions about the book, we got to be talking about a couple of different things. And one really interesting thing that came up was how to define LGBTQ literature. And by the way, I will say that I am going to put a link to Jen the Librarian's video announcing the LGBTQ in translation read along for February and March if you'd like to check that out. There is still time since, as I said, it's February and March, but time is running out if you want to get a copy of this book and join in. The discussion has been really good so far. And as we started talking about how to define LGBTQ literature, Jen posed the question, does queerness need to be a central theme of the book in order for it to be considered a queer book or a queer classic? And there were a, a bunch of different opinions about this. Most of us are on the same page for the most part. And the reason it came out of a discussion about this book is that it is described as sort of a revolutionary queer title published in 1995 in China. And when you actually read the book, the LGBTQ content itself is really subtle almost to the point where you could kind of overlook it completely and just focus on the speculative fiction aspects of the book. So we were, I think a couple of us were taken by surprise that it was so subdued in its approach to discussion of LGBTQ topics. It's interesting to read this and think that this is supposed to be groundbreaking and revolutionary and it's actually very low key. But then when you read the supplemental material from Ari Larissa Heinrich, the translator, she basically points out that this was published in 1995 in China and things had just drastically changed. Uh, there were a lot of things that, uh, in terms of politics, that made it possible for like the punk scene to come out in China and for people to begin having conversations. However, conversation around homosexuality was still very censored in China at the time. So I found that really interesting because when you take the perspective of the time and the place in which this was published, it actually was really groundbreaking and really revolutionary. But when we look at it now with our 2022 Western mindsets, it's easy to look at this and think, oh, that's so low key. That's like nothing. <laughs> but it actually was a lot. And that, Anyway, point being, that is where the discussion got started. There are a lot of different ways to think about this. Does a book have to have an LGBTQ author to be an LGBTQ book or an LGBTQ classic? I tend to think that there are some things that can be an LGBTQ book, but maybe not an LGBTQ classic. And my example of that was, and this will kind of tie into a later conversation point, my example was Michael Shabon, because The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay has a gay character. And it really deals with his sort of self-loathing and his coming out process and his journey to acceptance of himself. But this book is doing a lot of other things. And I have a tendency where if there's a character who is LGBTQ in a book, I will tag it as an LGBTQ book on Storygraph, for example. But I might not always think of it as quote unquote LGBTQ literature. And that's kind of where I'm at with this book. Great literature. I would tag it as LGBTQ, but I wouldn't call it a gay classic or an LGBTQ classic, or however you want to phrase that. So that's my thinking on that. But Michael Chabon identifies as straight. He is married to a woman. 
And he has also written a book called The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, which is really interesting and very heavily deals with a little bit of maybe possible bisexuality and struggling to define your own sexuality and experimenting a little bit, which is really interesting. And it comes from an author who identifies as straight. And I don't want to speculate on what an author's sexual past might include, and I don't think it would be fair to do so. So I am not going to do that. But he has a really great understanding of what someone in that position might feel. And Garrett Ewing, who commented on my Friday Reads video where I kind of introduced this topic, meant, pointed out in a subsequent comment that a lot of gay romance novels are written by women. And I, that's very true. I've read a lot of gay romance novels that have been written by women. And I actually prefer the ones that are written by women. And part of the reason for that is that if you read a gay romance written by a man, it tends to be just porn. But if you read a gay romance written by a woman, there's a story. There are characters. And they pretty deeply try to understand or at least empathize with the gay male characters. And they make them relatable, which is really nice. So I wouldn't call those not gay books or LGBTQ books. You know, you can debate the literary merit of them all you want, but... It's it's an interesting little wrinkle in the question. And that kind of ties in with a question from Roz at Scally Dandling about the books. I'll put a link to her channel in the description box down below. Uh, a question that she, or a wrinkle that she brought up, uh, which is, I have been surprised or more confused, or perhaps when books by heterosexual authors are called LGBTQ plus literature because there's a queer character or storyline. But then is it LGBTQ plus literature if a queer author writes a book where it isn't a central aspect of the book? And who I think of when this comes up is James Baldwin. James Baldwin did identify as gay, and he wrote books that definitely had LGBTQ plus elements. For instance, Go Tell It on the Mountain, which is kind of autofiction. It is inspired by his life and his coming of age and him coming to terms with his own sexuality with a father who was a preacher, a step stepfather who was a preacher and who did not approve. And I would say this is an LGBTQ classic. He also wrote one of the biggest and most well-known LGBTQ classics, which is Giovanni's Room. I think that's an undisputable, pretty unassailable LGBTQ classic right there. But he also wrote If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a book that does not have any LGBTQ plus content. So does it count as LGBTQ plus literature because of its author? And really, when you think about it, James Baldwin, as someone who did identify as part of the LGBTQ community, was probably informed by all aspects of himself and all of his writing. So can you separate one part of his identity and say, oh, it's not part of this book? This is where I think it gets really complicated. James Baldwin was gay. He was also a black man. He was also an American. He was also someone who immigrated to Paris in order to live a more open life. He was all of those things, and all of those things informed his writing. So can you really take one thing out? And can he be more than one thing in all of these books? I think that's where it gets really complicated. And it leads into a bigger discussion, which is that I think it's difficult to define what LGBTQ means, because LGBTQ means so many different things. I mean, literally, in the acronym, it's lesbians, bisexual people, transgender people, gay people, queer people, question people, asexual people, intersex people. All of those things have been lumped under the same umbrella, and they are all very different experiences of the world. In fact, some of them deal with sexual identity, some of them deal with gender identity, and those are very different things and they don't always correlate. But because they are so often lumped together, they get confused a lot. And I think there's a good reason for that. You know, we are all part of the same community if we are LGBTQIA+, and we need to support each other, we need to band together, and I, I like that we are all part of the same acronym because it reminds us to support each other. And by the way, I feel like this is a good time for me to mention that the week that I filmed this, Greg Abbott, has, uh, the governor of Texas, has announced that allowing an underage transgender person to transition uh, should be considered child abuse. And 
It's appalling for many reasons, many, many, many reasons. The Montana Book Company is doing a fundraiser. They are selling t-shirts on Bonfire and uh, all of the proceeds will go to transgender charities and support. So I will put a link to that in the description box down below as well. Please support it if you can. If you don't want to support that, please support your, your transgender brothers and sisters any way that you can because it, it's a lot. And I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, but that is a real shame. And that that is also why it is nice that we are all part of the same community, because we can try to support each other and lift this up. And uh, different parts of the LGBTQ community have different levels of privilege. And I, as a white gay man, have more privilege than a transgender person of any <laughs> any race, any gender, um, how, however you wanted to find it. I, ha I just generally have more privilege than them because I am seen as more human than them, but I'm seen as less human than other people. So it is important for me to try to support and raise up the rest of the LGBTQ community to the level that I'm at, and then we can hopefully raise all of us up to the level of everybody else as well. Anyway, I pulled a bunch of books that either have LGBTQ content or are LGBTQ authors just to try to illustrate this point. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but I do want to just point out how different these books are, how different these authors are, and how different the experience related in them is. There's, of course, <laughs> I'm dropping books. There's The Color Purple by Alice Walker. There's On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong. City of Night by John Rishi, which is an LGBTQ classic. Guapa by Salim Haddad. Gordo by Jamie Cortez. Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg. Blackbird by Larry Duplichan. Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. And A Boy's Own Story by Edmund White. Every single one of these books has LGBTQ content or an LGBTQ author. And every, so every single one of these books qualifies, but they are all vastly different and reflect vastly different experiences of the world. And that is why it's so hard to define what LGBTQ content is because Leslie Feinberg's experience of the world was very different from Salim Haddad's, which was very different from Jamie Cortez's and John Rishi's and Edmund White's and Ocean Vuong's and so on and so forth, all the way down the line. And their experiences are also very different from what mine has been. And that's okay, but it makes it difficult because being LGBTQ plus means different things to different people. And my experience is very different from someone else's. So what I might be willing to give a pass to, somebody else might not. Pardon the interruption, this is future Greg, who is editing this video the day after I filmed it, wanting to jump in and say something about the books that I just talked about in this video, and how really they only reflect two components of the LGBTQ plus community, lesbians and gay people. There is only one book in that list that really has transgender representation, and that is Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg. I haven't read like City of Night, it's possible there's a little bit of it in there. But those books reflect ways in which a lot of components of the LGBTQ plus community are invisible and have been invisible. And we're getting a little bit better. Uh, there's growing representation of transgender, bisexual, or asexual representation, but it's really light. So I wanted to point that out to mention that there are still ways we need to do better because even me going through my bookshelves, flipping through, only hit upon one book that really had transgender representation. So that is something that would be worth seeking out yourself and that reflects my bookshelves and that is something that I am continuing to try to do better at and be aware of as I choose books to read and you can see that in how for the Montana Book Company Reading Challenge for this year, one of the prompts is to read a book by an LGBTQ plus author. And I wanted to make sure I selected an author who is one of those categories that I typically don't <laughs> focus on too much. And I have selected a book by an asexual author to do it. 
So I just wanted to point that out because I think that is an important part of this discussion as well. Visibility for all aspects of the LGBTQ plus community. Now I will let you get back to the rest of the video. There's also the issue of how able or willing an author was to come out of the closet in the past. It's only pretty recently that it has been okay or possible for an author to come out of the closet and identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. And 50 years ago, that even the term LGBTQ wouldn't have existed. 20 years ago, the Q and the plus wouldn't have been there. So things have changed really quickly. And again, from our 2022 Western mindset, it's really easy to just think it's always been like this, and it hasn't. Just getting personal for a second, uh, I believe it was 1997 when Ellen DeGeneres came out on her sitcom. I was already a teenager when that happened. So I lived and grew up in a world where being gay meant you had to hide and you couldn't really talk openly. And any representation on screen or mostly in books even was very cliched and stereotypical. And I had to kind of live with that. And one of the things that was difficult about coming out was that I had to try to reconcile myself with the stereotype. And I would think, well, I'm not into interior design. I don't know where I fit in that world. And then you have to realize they're trying to define something for you, which is something important that I th believe it was Garrett Ewing also said. It's important not to allow other people, I guess specifically cisgendered heterosexual people, to do the defining for us. Because more often than not, and of course not all straight people, not all cisgender people, uh, will get it wrong. And they just don't understand and it's historically it's been easy to try to cl create cliches and stereotypes that aren't necessarily true or accurate for all people because again we're not a monolith we're not all the same we're all different and that's fine just like everybody else but it does create a problem because if we are specifically defining lgbtq plus literature as something that has an lgbtq plus author or something that has lgbtq plus content then we are really limiting ourselves to books that were published in the last 50 years. A little bit in the last 100, but it's a very small window, and you eliminate people who were not able to come out. And even when you think about it, in the modern world, there are people who live in specific areas who might have a much harder time identifying as LGBTQ. Uh, it's one of the reasons I purchased Guapa by Salim Haddad, who uh, the character of this book lives in an Arab nation and is struggling with the fact that he feels he can't come out because it's criminalized. So even today, there are authors who can't come out for one reason or another. And there are authors who are very private people, and that's fine. They, when I decided that I wanted to do, um, for the Montana Book Company's Reading Challenge, I want to read, uh, and, and one of the prompts is to read a book by an LGBTQ plus author. And I wanted to try to read one of the lesser known uh, categories that people don't traditionally think of. And one of the ones I really wanted to do was asexual. Well, it's a little difficult. Sometimes if you Google an author, they don't, necessarily blast their sexuality out there. And that's fine, they shouldn't have to. But it gets even harder the further back you go in the past. Like Oscar Wilde is an outlier. He was out and it is known that he was gay. He suffered for it very much. But what does that mean as well? Because like the picture of Dorian Gray does not have any explicit homosexual content in it but we know that the author was, so does it count as an LGBTQ plus book? If we think representation is the only thing that matters, then you can't count Oscar Wilde's work. And is that fair? I don't necessarily think that it is, but I certainly think there are exceptions to that where you can say representation matters. And if I'm gonna bring up the thing I hate to bring up, which is Harry Potter. Calling Dumbledore gay after the fact, when all the books are out and there's nothing to represent him in the books as a gay man, doesn't count as representation. You cannot call the Harry Potter books LGBTQ plus literature or anything like that because there's nothing in it that would classify them as such. And the fact that more content has been produced since the books came out that continues to refuse to deal with Dumbledore as a gay man and his sexuality, 
it just makes it worse. So let, let, let's leave Harry Potter behind. But another one that I think is interesting is The Power of the Dog by Thomas Savage, which was my favorite read of last year. Now, Annie Peru in her afterward to this book even points out that it's interesting that reviewers at the time this book was published, which I believe was 1967, and I'm going to check that right now, 1967, only one mentioned homosexual content in this book. If you are a gay person or an LGBTQ plus person and you read this book, you will pick up on it. Absolutely you will. But there are a lot of people who were able to read this book and completely overlook the LGBTQ plus content in this book. If you watch the movie, which just came out recently, it's much more difficult. You kind of have to reckon with that. But if you read the book, especially in the time it was published, it's really subtle. It's there, but it's really subtle. So does The Power of the Dog therefore count as LGBTQ plus literature? I would say it does. You may differ <laughs> on that. And if you have thoughts, sure, put them in the comment section down below. But part of the point there is that historically, authors have been less likely to identify as LGBTQ+. And again, they might not have even had the terminology to do so. And the terminology has really changed a lot. Some things, we, terms we used to use are things we don't say anymore. And uh, there are more categories now. People have much more understanding of themselves. Concepts like being gender fluid or gender neutral. When I was a teenager, I would... If you told me, oh, this person is gender neutral, I'd be like, what is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? But we understand it now. It's out there. And that's a good thing. But it makes it difficult because we can't even accurately say who belongs in the canon if we say that the author needs to identify as part of the LGBTQ community, if that makes sense. And it's interesting as well because you do kind of fall into an own voices conversation and I think own voices are important for many many reasons and this was something that one book one review commented on my Friday Reads video. Let me read what she said. Great point about the definition for LGBTQ plus literature as I feel so uncomfortable especially towards authors there. For me that would demand so much extra research into an author's privacy and honestly they don't have to be out publicly for their books to count or have value but so often the discussion goes into the own voices corner, forcing people to open up and share things they might not want with everyone. This is also true for any type of own voices. Personally, I think this is demanding too much and why am I, why I am more in the corner of the author is dead and focus on the book more than the author. What I would really like though, is a really good book slash guide about queer coding over the ages and culture, as those are things I think I miss quite a bit in books. Uh, that's a whole separate other thing, but I, I agree. And if I were in academia, I would love to write that book. But I'm not in academia, and I don't have the time. <laughs> but I think it would be, I, I agree, it would be absolutely fascinating to do that. Own voices, I think, are absolutely important because it goes back to what Garrett was saying. You can't allow other people to try to define you for yourself. And I think of American Dirt by Janine Cummins, which was very controversial because she wrote a book pretending to be an authority about illegal immigration from Mexico specifically. And she wrote a book that really resorts to the lowest common denominator a lot in the way it depicts the people and the scenarios in the book. And it's kind of gross. And then you compare that with Infinite Country by Patricia Engel, which is much more nuanced and much more compassionate and empathetic and has a much more layered and meaningful discussion of the characters and of illegal immigration without focusing on violent cartels and making people seem like cartoonish stereotypes. So representation and own voices matter. And I think where it really comes in is that we need own voices because traditionally those people don't have access to tell their story. And therefore other people need to tell it for them and those other people might get it wrong. When everybody has equal access to share their story and their experience and be listened to and heard by the majority of people, then something like own voices will be less important. For now, we need it, and that's just the way it is. And to bring up a book I haven't read yet, so I can't properly weigh in, I wanna talk for a second about Honeybee by Craig Silvey. This has been a, a book that caused a bit of controversy in Australia. Craig Sylvie is mostly notable because he wrote Jasper Jones, which is uh, something I really want to read, but have not gotten around to as well. But an author actually recommended this book to me last year. 
and they mentioned that they have a transgender son. And this book actually helped them understand their son's point of view and the difficult things he went through going to school and being bullied and all of that. Which is interesting because the controversy about this book is that it focuses on sort of torture porn for its transgender character. Craig Silby does not identify as transgender, but the protagonist of the book is. And a lot of people who are part of the transgender community in Australia have said that it's negative depictions like this that make people assume that all transgender people experience the same thing and have really unhappy, desperate lives. And you know, it's, it's true to a degree, but not everybody. And it does get better. So they don't like representation like this, and that's fair. But at the same time, this was specifically recommended to me by an author who said that it really helped them understand the difficulty that their son was going through and the difficulty that he had identifying as her son. And maybe that's worth something. So it's difficult, again, and I don't have answers. And maybe I should have tried to settle on an answer before talking about this, but I think the conversation is one of the more interesting things about it. So I'd love to hear what you think about it. And I've raised a bunch of different ways of looking at it. And I've given, I've given a lot of my own thoughts about it, but a lot of these thoughts are really conflicting because again, I think own voices really matter when it comes to LGBTQ plus literature. But I also think we can't assume we know who is LGBTQ. Sometimes it will surprise you. And sometimes the fact that someone who is not transgender writes a story about a transgender character raises awareness for other cisgender people about issues related to that. So. I don't know. It's difficult. I think LGBTQ literature means different things to different people. And we, we get to decide for ourselves what it means to us. Maybe we can't define it for other people as well. Just like I might think that um, The Catcher in the Rye is a really great book. I loved it when I was a teenager. I talk about it a fair amount on the channel. But that experience of the world depicted in that book is not everyone's experience of the world. It was mine as a teenager, but it's not everyone's. So me thinking that it's a classic piece of literature doesn't necessarily mean something to everybody else. And maybe that seems like a cop-out. But I think that that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. I'd love to hear what you think about this. I think it's a fascinating topic. And I, I agree with one book, one review. A book about queer coding over the ages would be fascinating. So, and I, I don't have the time or bandwidth to write it. So if anybody out there wants to do it, please. Or if you have recommendations about that, please let me know and we can share it with one book, one review. Anyway, uh, all I will ask, please be respectful in, in the comments. Everybody is who regularly follows this channel, but there are occasionally people who will... I'll say troll, look up topics like this and just say kind of nasty, hurtful things. If you say nasty, hurtful things, you will be immediately blocked, but you probably didn't even watch this video, at least not to this point, to know that you would get instantly blocked. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I know it, it involves a lot of feelings that are very strong because especially when you are, if it feels like your perspective is being denied, it hurts. I get that. So I would just love to know what you think. Join the conversation in the comment section down below. And as always, I really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your energy, all of that stuff. And I will be back until next time. Happy reading.